it's a great pleasure to come here. Uh, my wife's with me, and we love Brisbane. We've been here before. And, uh, of course, uh, Professor Brown has been a friend and colleague, and it's happy, to, happy for me to be here and have a chance to interact with her outstanding research group, one of the best in the world. So uh, I'm really happy to uh, be here in Brisbane and share my opinions and ideas, and there will be times at the, at the end for questions. And some of you know, I love to argue. So if you think I say something stupid, get ready to argue. I will challenge you, and we could maybe get in. Well, anyway, let's, let's go on. Uh, here are my uh, disclosures uh, uh, over the last uh, five years. Everybody in this room knows that the major health problem in today's world are non-communicable diseases. And these are due primarily to unhealthful lifestyles. And can you all read? Okay, so I don't have to read these uh, numbers to you, but uh, uh, certainly really high numbers of uh, these major uh, chronic diseases. And of course, this is extremely costly, billions, trillions of dollars around the world to care for these people with chronic diseases. I want to focus, obviously, on physical inactivity as a contributor to non-communicable chronic diseases. And I was so happy, as I'm sure uh, all of you in exercise science were, uh, back in 2012, when The Lancet, one of the world's leading medical journals, the week before the Olympics, devoted an entire issue to physical activity. I mean, what a deal. I mean, that, that was really exciting. And Professor Ayman Lee uh, led this effort on, uh, well, you can, again, you can all read, you can see the, uh, the title. And we were very conservative with this. We were trying to, you know, identify the, uh, how big a problem inactivity is. And we had collected databases from around the world. I'm not sure which ones we had here from Australia and other countries. We had a lot of databases. And what we came up with is that, uh, well, again, you can read a high percentage, substantial, not, not high, percentage of non-communicable communicable diseases is attributable to inactivity. And further calculations are, if we got everybody to meet the physical activity recommendations, there'd be 5.3 fewer mi deaths, million deaths in the world each year. Isn't that something? And it would be an increase in life expectancy. And then you, some of you could be thinking, well, my God, there's 7 billion people in the world. 5.3 million deaths doesn't sound like very many. So to put that in perspective, uh, the experts say smoking causes 5 million. So inactivity is as big a public health problem, or in my opinion, an even bigger public health problem than smoking. And the reason I say that is that the data from uh, Dr. Lee's paper, we used physical activity as the exposure, uh, and physical inactivity as the exposure. So self-reported physical activity and physical inactivity to come up with that calculation of 5.3 million deaths. The problem with that is self-reported activity is an inaccurate measure. Now, I administered a questionnaire today uh, to uh, Dean Abernathy, and according to the questionnaire, He's, uh, he run, uh, does a triathlon every week. So I think that illustrates that self-reported questionnaires, some people exaggerate just a little bit, and et, et cetera. So here's a, a report, uh, well, a few years ago now, from our big database, which I'm going to talk more about uh, over the next, uh, what is it, two, two and a half hours. Um, here in this large group of men and women, on the medical history, we have their self-report of physical activity. So when we look in the women and in the men, oh my God, what happened to that? Must be a, an Aussie projector or something. Um, low, moderate, high activity, low, moderate, high. And this is, I didn't burden the slide with lots and lots of numbers and significant, et cetera, but this is a significant downward trend or inactivity. Get out of the inactive group into the moderately active group and you, you're benefit. You're less likely to die. You know, 15, 20 percent lower odds of dying if you're in the high active group. But look at this. 
because in this database, we have a maximal exercise test done in the laboratory. So we have data on cardiorespiratory fitness. Now, Dean Abernathy could exaggerate for me a little bit on that questionnaire. It's kind of hard to lie to that treadmill when we're taking you to exhaustion. So fitness is a more accurate measure of a person's activity than is asking them about their activity. Activity questionnaires are valid. They just they have a large error range. So look, low fit, moderately fit, 40% lower odds of dying. A little further benefit maybe for those in the high fit group. And now, well, what's low fit? Uh, from our first papers, I'll show you. Well, I'll go ahead and show you now. Uh, we'll show you in just a second. A uh, large database I've been following for uh, 35 years. Again, a very extensive clinical examination. The exam takes three or four hours. All kinds of lab data, body composition, uh, cardiorespiratory fitness, et cetera, et cetera. And our first report on fitness and mortality is an old paper, now 1989. And you see here for women and for men, get out of that low fit group. So some of you should be thinking, well, what is low fit? It's the bottom 20% in each age gender category, the bottom 20%. So moderately fit is the next 40% of the distribution. And although we call this high fit, these are not marathon runners. It's the top 40% of the distribution. So to add a little more explanation to that, the bottom 20%, again, unfit, to get out of that, what do you have to do? To get out of the low fit into the moderately fit group, well, surprise, surprise, it's the US physical activity recommendations. I think the Australian are pretty much the same. The World Health Organization recommendations, 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity activity like walking. So again, you don't have to uh, run hard every day to get out of this group and get into this group. 30 minutes of walking most days of the week in bouts, 10 minute bouts as we say, uh, you'll get out of the low fit and we got plenty of evidence to support that into the moderately fit. So look at the lower risk of dying. The death rates here in the unfit women, 40 per 10,000 woman years and about 18 for 10,000 women years in those who are moderately fit. And a little further benefit we typically see in the high fit. But getting out of this group, that's what is important. So uh, as time went on and the population grew, because this clinic, in fact, is still in operation, uh, and as time passes, what happens? People die. Do you people celebrate Halloween down here? Huh, what? No, you don't do Halloween? What's the matter with you? You know, so in the U.S., of course, Halloween's the big deal. And whenever I go to a Halloween party, you're supposed to dress up like something terrifying. And I dress like an epidemiologist. Why? Because if you want to do this kind of research, what do you have to do? Count up dead bodies. So yes, I'm vicious. Count those dead bodies. So as time went on, and again, you young people, I know you don't get this, you're going to die. Everybody dies eventually. Death rate is one. And so as we, pass, we had time pass, and we got more people in the database, then we could look at cardiovascular disease outcomes. And does this look kind of similar to what I showed you for all-cause mortality? Now, the death rates, of course, for all-cause uh, and for cardiovascular disease are higher in men than in women. Do any of you know why that's true? Men are more sensitive and caring. And that's stressful to live that way. So we're more likely to die in these studies. But again, low, moderate, high fitness, get out of the low fit group, got the risk of dying of cardiovascular disease more than 50%. Not quite so much in men, but still substantial 
reduction. So at this point in the mid 90s, um, again, we didn't still have the, the, the population uh, is about 75% men and 25% women. And again, I wish we had, I wish it was the other way around because you women are just lousy subjects. Lousy subjects for research like this. The darn women won't die. And the men, boy, they give us these outcomes. So anyway, uh, it took a while to get enough to even do the cardiovascular disease deaths. Didn't have enough to do this analysis in women. But here in the men, we cross-tabulate low, moderate, high fitness, and none of the other, at this point, American Heart Association, and I think most groups around the world, said there are three risk factors for cardiovascular disease, smoking, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. These guys had none of the other risk factors. These had any one, and these had two or all three. But in all of these groups, again, this is a highly statistically significant gradient, and get out of that low fit group, whether you have none of the other risk factors, and this is significant, or if you have all three. Now I've got a couple of my favorite numbers are on this slide. So look at this, these are the guys who smoke, have high blood pressure and high cholesterol, but are high fit. Their risk of dying, this is uh, about 24, 25 per 10,000 man years. So 24, 25, and look at the low fit guys who have none of the risk factors. It's higher, about 30. Ooh, are you getting the picture? Inactivity, which leads to low fitness, is really bad for you. So let's turn to fitness and some other uh, health outcomes. Uh, for example, here just in uh, women, uh, fitness and breast cancer mortality. Have you seen this pattern in my data before? Low fit, oh, get out of the low fit group, lower it, and even more of a difference here in the high fit women for breast cancer risk. And note that all of these analyses that I'll be showing you, I haven't pointed this out uh, earlier, but we always adjust for lots and lots of possible confounders, and we can never make this go away. It is a powerful, powerful association. And here, again, in women, uh, the risk of developing incident hypertension. So none of them were hypertensive at their first visit, followed up over however many years. A few developed hypertension uh, and low fit. Again, highly significant trend, moderate and high. Are you getting the picture? Being moderately fit is really good for you. And what do you have to do to be moderately fit? Three 10-minute walks a day, five days a week. Don't tell me you don't have time to do that. That's the major reason people in the U.S. give for not being active. Wendy, probably the same here in Australia, right? Just too busy, don't have time. Well, now they're not all my favorites, but we can go all the way back to President Reagan, and every American president has actually been quite active. H.W. Bush, I mean, we, he's part of this database. He was tested at the Cooper Clinic. W, he was on our advisory board and was tested as part of the database. Uh, Mr. Obama, uh, Mr. Clinton, they were all very physically active while president of the United States. So don't tell me you're busier than the president. I don't think anybody's that busy. Uh, here's a report I, I, I think, well, I really, well, I like all of our data, of course, but uh, this one, um, 8,100 men who had, at the time of their first visit to the clinic, they'd had physician-diagnosed hypertension. When they came for the first time, I have hypertension. And, of course, at uh, the, that visit and every visit, their blood pressure is measured in the lab carefully following a a good protocol. So these hypertensive guys, when their blood pressure was measured at the time of their exam, blood pressure was in normal range. Good for you. Your blood pressure is controlled. Some of them were still in stage one hypertension. 
don't ask me what the cut points are <laughs> in systolic and diastolic pressure. I mean, still stage one hypertension. And some of them were even in stage two hypertension. And these are well-educated uh, people from mid to upper socioeconomic strata. Uh, to, I mean, they could afford, to, well, they all had doctors and, and, and so forth. But some of them, their blood pressure wasn't controlled. But look at this. They were still in stage two hypertension at the time of their examination. And how long did we follow these guys? Uh, oh, no, wait a minute, I'm sorry. I, well, I don't have that slide in here. I think the average follow-up after their uh, final exam here was something like 11, 12 years. And there were, I don't know, 1,500 deaths, something like that. So these guys, after their exam, but for those who's fit, who had high fitness at the time of their exam, look at that cardiovascular disease incidence, 10 per 1,000 man years, compared to, can you guess where I'm going with this? Those whose blood pressure was controlled, but they were low fit. And their cardiovascular disease incidence rate was 17 per 1,000 man years. So in this population, you're better off, if you're hypertensive, to not have your blood pressure controlled, but be high fit, and to have your blood pressure controlled. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't try to have your blood pressure controlled. I mean, the lowest death rate here is this group, whose blood pressure was controlled, but also were high fit. It's just that some of you may be physicians, I don't know. Doctor, if you have patients with hypertension, do not congratulate yourself too much if you get their blood pressure under control unless you also know what their fitness level is. Is it possible here in Australia to have a medical visit and not have your blood pressure measured? It's possible. It's not very darn likely. You're going to have your blood pressure measured. Is it possible to have a medical exam and not have your fitness measured? <laughs> what percentage of medical exams do, do people get their fitness measured? I don't know. I don't know whether you have any data. What did you say? 3%? Oh, zero. Zero. Well, I'm sure it's not zero. It might be 0 0.001 or something, but, but not very many. So look at these. What is important here? It's just like in the U.S. at least, you go for a medical exam, whether it's your ophthalmologist, your dermatologist, your cardiologist. The first thing you do when you come in from the waiting room, the nurse says, Get on the scale. I need your weight. And I said, well, you don't need my weight. And I said, come on, fat guy, get on that scale. We need you cannot escape a doctor's office in the U.S. without having your weight measured. And I thought of this the other day because they recently they, they said, okay, what's your height? And I've been telling them 5'5". Five, five. Aha. My next visit, I'm going to say, I don't know, somewhere between 6'1 and 6'2". And if they enter that, ah, my BMI is not going to be okay. Well, that's, that's not going to happen. So anyway, you get the idea. Being active and fit is really good for you. And it is good even for old codgers. So May published this now several years ago. Men and women in the prime of life, 60 and older. You see 40 or 4,000 of them followed for 14, nearly a 1,000 of them died. Now look at this again. Age groups at the start of their follow-up, low, moderate, high fit, low, moderate, high fit. Can you guess where the pointer is going next? Yes. 80 and older who were high fit had a death rate of, what, about 13. Those who were 60 to 69 who were unfit had double the death rate. So fitness is as important as two, two and a half decades of aging. Hmm. I have told May that she has to uh, repeat this study now because my definition of the prime of life has changed. So it's now 70 and older. And, of course, we already know what that's going to look like, but, but in any event. Now, again, you young people, I know you're going to be, I told you you're already going to die. And some of you, 
the doctor is going to, I don't know how the death certificate thing works here in Australia, but in the U.S., the doctor writes on the death certificate primary cause of death, secondary cause of death, tertiary, other causes. And in this analysis, uh, out of the 4,100 who died, this number had dementia listed as one of their causes of death. So isn't this something? Get out of the low fit and cut your risk of having the doctor write dementia, whether he or she diagnosed it properly or not. Uh, I've never met anyone, actually, who said, oh, I'd like to live to be a very old age, and it's okay if in my last 10 years I'm thoroughly demented and someone has to give me a bath and wipe my bottom and all that. No one wants to live that way. So a way to avoid it, be physically active. Let's look at some uh, other population subgroups. And uh, some of you know I've focused on this fitness, fatness thing for 25 years or so. And a lot of people don't like me because of this, but the hell with them. I'm going to keep doing it. Uh, there's an enormous amount of confusion about obesity as a health factor. Uh, this is now several months, but I'll bet it hasn't changed that much. I go to Google, type in these terms. Oh, nearly a million hits on inactivity and obesity. Yeah, but there's 70 million on diet and obesity. Oh, well, that was just Google. Let's go to PubMed. Okay, 2,100 manuscripts, 44,000 manuscripts. So this is why I think there's a huge imbalance in the discussion of energy balance, and that's why we have the Global Energy Balance Network, by the way, to try to uh, address this, I want to see more balance. I'm not saying ignore diet, ignore obesity. I want more balance in the discussion. So, okay, let's go to the obesity epidemic. Clearly, there's an obesity epidemic around the world, and what, 60% uh, of Australians are overweight or obese, or something like that. Well, we're ahead of you. I think we have 70% overweight or obese. Okay, what, is, what has caused this increase in weight gains in populations around the world? Well, it's too many people or more people being in a positive energy balance on more and more days. Now, this is a simple model. It's just, you know, the laws of thermodynamics do apply. Calories consumed, calories burned. You consume more on a lot of days, then you burn, you're going to gain weight. That energy has to be stored, and it's typically stored as fat. Now, I know some of you are physiologists. I know it's far more complicated than that last simple slide. And if you have questions about these complex mechanisms, the various systems in the body, please feel free to ask questions after I finish the lecture. And uh, Dr. Coombs will be glad to come up and explain. I don't understand this stuff, but I know it's complex. Exercise affects the neuroscience. What you eat affects neuroscience, et cetera. Et cetera. It is very complex, and that's why we need more studies on energy balance to try to figure out all of this. And again, just to illustrate the nonsense that is out there in the world, this uh, from... Uh, uh, reported a few years ago, I was in England, British Science Festival meeting, and I left the guy's name off of this because he might be r related to one of you, but uh, according to the reporter, this head of one of the leading science institutes in the uh, in, uh, United Kingdom said this, 1980, this is what Brits were eating, and now it is this. What? Can any fool believe that? I mean, if that were actually true, the average Brit, because also they said there's no change in energy expenditure. So the, the women in Britain have increased their caloric intake by, what, uh, uh, whew, God, 2,000 calories a day. So they're gaining a kilogram every three or four days. Oh, my God. The average British woman now weighs 12 tons. I mean, this is utter nonsense that some famous professor said. So you want to know the cause of, of the obesity epidemic? It's James Watt. We've been decades 
engineering human energy expenditure down and down and down. For example, on the job. So Tim Church published this a few years ago, took data from the U.S. Department of Labor over the last 50 years, you know, good job classifications, he assigned met values to each of, you know, using standard approaches to each of these. Service jobs increasing in norm. This is, you know, being a professor or being a dean even more, sitting on your bottom all day. Mining, manufacturing, I know you have a little mining in this part of the world, but I'll bet even here the number of people doing it is less than 50 years ago. Agriculture. I grew up poor family out in Kansas, middle of nowhere, and right about here, I decided in the late 50s, this is too darn much hard work. I'm going to go to college. And my grandpa said, yes, Stevie, get yourself an education, and you can get a job in out of the weather. Oh, my God, a job in out of the weather. How, what could beat that? So look what's happened to agricultural jobs. Again, I've influenced the United States. They, they said, oh, Stevie left the farm. Let's leave also. And look what's happened to agricultural jobs. So Tim gave these data to Diana Thomas, a brilliant mathematician, not a public health person, mathematician, and gave her the various numbers and said, estimate for me the decline in energy expenditure on the job in American women, or in American men and women. And here are the numbers. And if you're familiar with some of the obesity literature, the experts say the worldwide obesity epidemic can be explained by a positive caloric balance of 70 to 90 calories a day. So this is more than enough. Now, you think this isn't true? Well, do a study, get, uh, get data on jobs, do analyses, and show we're wrong. But does anyone really believe that there's been no change in occupational energy expenditure, like that one idiotic statement earlier, no change in energy expenditure. Minute, on the job? Are you kidding? Well, another area. What about household energy management? Cooking, cleaning, child care. Now, when Grandma made mashed potatoes, what did she have to do? Well, three months ago, she had to plant the blasted potatoes out in the garden and, you know, till and so forth. And then she'd have to go out there and dig them up, bring them in, scrub them, maybe peel them, cut them up, cook them, and then mash them. There was no such thing as, uh, what is that thing that spins around and mashes stuff? She had to do the work. It took a lot more work. Or, uh, and how do you put potatoes on the table? You go to the freezer, and you get out the bag, and you go over to the microwave, and yes, I, I can see some of you are old enough. You remember when there was no such thing as a microwave, right? So you punch in the microwave, and then you go sit down and watch television. No, you don't have to mash those things. So what we came up with here, well, I suggested to Tim, I said, there are other components of energy expenditure than occupation. I said, why don't you do some? He said, I don't have time. You guys do it. So I had a bright PhD student. I said, Ed, get on this. So this is what he came up with about, uh, what is that, 1,800 calories a week, less energy expenditure in household management in American women. And we got viciously attacked by our female colleagues. They said, oh, you're just saying that women are fat, lazy slobs, and if they just did more housework. We didn't say that at all. He said, this is what has happened. And again, some of you, I can remember, when Grandma got the first vacuum cleaner that anyone in this little town had ever seen. Yes, vacuum cleaners. They haven't always existed. The cave dwellers didn't have vacuum cleaners, and neither did your great-grandparents. So we've engineered energy expenditure at home, down and down and down. And, of course, screen time went up pretty substantially over this period as well. Now, you people here do a lot better on these uh, areas than we do in the United States. But it's uh, whether it's going to work, uh, uh, going to school, et cetera. We know this is work data. Now, I, I didn't, didn't put in a slide, but in America, the vast majority of children are delivered at school by their parents right by the front door. There's a long line of cars waiting to pull up and let the kid out. 
Now, I know how you're supposed to get to school. You know how I went to school when I was uh, in elementary school? Pat took me. That was my pony. I had to ride him a mile and a half to school. And if you go look at the data, riding a horse, it depends on how fast the horse is going, it's three to four mets energy expenditure. You have to hang on, keep from falling off. So, and then of course, after I rode this guy to school and tied him up in the barn and went to school and then came back after school, what did I have to do? Oh, tied him up in the barn and gave him some hay to eat during the day. And then what did I have to do when I came to get him? Oh, you people don't know about horses, right? You put hay in up here and something comes out back here. And so you can't just leave that there. You gotta scoop it up and take it out and put it on the pile. So it takes more energy to take a horse to school, or ride a horse to school. And then of course also, and we come to this fitness fatness, so I'm down now to just two hours, I know. Uh, overweight is actually good for you. Catherine Flegel published this, well, decade, a decade ago, but in the United States, big national databases, with the reference category being normal weight, same numbers as, as here, and of course, underweight people are more likely to die. And most of the experts think that, they, well, they're underweight because they're really sick. And so, yeah, they're more likely to die. But look at this, the overweight people in the United States, per year, there are 86,000 fewer deaths than predicted on the population. Okay, in class one obesity, there were 30,000 more deaths, but it actually wasn't statistically significant. Class two obesity, yes. So overweight is as good for you as class two obesity is bad for you. So don't believe all this nonsense you read. Now look at the data. And then of course, bring fitness into this. Our first report on this was, my goodness, this is 20 years ago. At that point, the overweight cut point was 27 something. So in this analysis, in uh, however many minute it was, uh, normal weight was less than 27 BMI, overweight and obese. Number of deaths, man years of follow up. You're getting familiar with this low, moderate, high. Now notice here in the obese group, there aren't a lot of, there weren't a lot of high fit obese guys. So we combine, this is combined moderate and high, so at least moderately fit. Now if you search carefully around this room, you can find an obese guy who is high fit and proved it two weeks ago on his visit to the cardiologist. But anyway, uh, so this is moderate or high fit. And look at that death rate. Where am I going next? The normal weight guys who are unfit. So I'm not very smart, and I know that. Uh, and I presented this at an international uh, obesity meeting, and I got viciously attacked. And at the end, there's British guys with that's a lot of rubbish. He's not proven me wrong in the 20 years by showing new data. But uh, 20, 20 years ago, we published the first report. Tim published this a decade ago. These are men with, again, physician-diagnosed diabetes. They're sick. They've got diabetes. Normal weight, overweight, and obese. Low, moderate, high, low, moderate, high. Low, moderate, or high. This is cardiovascular disease mortality. Look at this risk compared to this. These guys are more than twice as likely to die. They've all got diabetes. These guys are normal weight, but they're unfit. They're more than twice as likely to die than the obese guys who are at least moderately fit. And then May did another of uh, her studies in the people in the prime of life, and again, she's got to repeat this now, but published this several years ago in JAMA. And this were actually, she showed the data per quintiles, so 20% in each group. So this is our traditional low fit, this is our moderately fit, and this is the high fit. But look at that again, get out of the low fit group. And these data adjusted for percent fat, 
there aren't a lot of other papers on fitness, fatness, and mortality where fatness was determined in the laboratory, not just the BMI, but measured in, in the laboratory. Or combining these data, here are the normal fat and the obese. These are the fit ones, moderate or high fit, and these are the unfit ones. Well, most of you are not epidemiologists, but what's more important here, fitness or fatness? You can be fat as measured in the laboratory, but if you're at least moderately fit, your risk of dying is a heck of a lot less than the unfit person who is not fat. I love our data. Can you imagine why? This apply, I didn't put it in the slide. It also applies to waist circumference. We look at waist circumference. So one of our more recent reports, you go to the doctor, and certainly if you're overweight or obese, you need to lose weight and counseling. And of course, they usually give you some crazy diet to follow. And some doctors will tell you to be more physically active. But you need to lose weight. You're fat. So we looked in this in the population of, well, you, you can all read, fairly large group. All of them had at least two examinations. Some of them had 25. The average number of exams in this analysis was about four and a half. More than 900 died during the 11 and a half years, the average follow-up. And again, we excluded those with chronic disease at baseline, and we adjusted for all kinds of things. So look at the risk of dying. These are quintiles, fifths of change, from the first exam to the last exam. Whether they had three exams or 23 exams, it's change in weight, change in percent fat. Doesn't look like it made any difference. Whether they gained weight, lost weight, stayed the same. There's just no difference. On the other hand, those who change their fitness, improve their fitness, that is a highly significant trend. Fitness is far more important than fatness as a health outcome. Thank God for that. Uh, but uh, now there is a problem where fitness is not, does not overcome the hazards of fatness doesn't matter to me. I've been married 50 years. I'm not looking for a date. But if some of you are looking for a date, if you're obese, you're going to have more trouble getting it than if you're not. And unfortunately, there's all kinds of bias against obesity. If you're looking for a job, it's harder to get if you're obese. If you're looking for a promotion, it's harder to get if you're obese. So there's lots of bias and discrimination against obese people. But uh, health, be fit. Don't worry about it. Now, there is another kind of uh, fitness, and that's muscular strength. I'll go through this fairly quickly. But in a subset of this cohort, we have uh, measured strength in the laboratory again, and very quickly, uh, all-cause mortality by thirds of strength. Get out of that bottom third, much less likely to die also significant across cardiovascular disease. Cancer mortality, very same pattern. Get out of that bottom third. And again, all these are adjusted for, well, this one's even adjusted for cardiorespiratory fitness. And I'll just say briefly, both muscular fitness and cardiorespiratory fitness are associated with poor health outcomes. They overlap a little bit, but when we adjust one for the other, it doesn't go away. Both are important. I love this more recent uh, paper uh, in men with hypertension. Low, moderate, high fitness, significant trend. Even when we adjust for cardiorespiratory fitness, okay, I know the trend's not significant, although this is significantly lower. So hypertensives, yes, do some resistance training to develop adequate strength. Now do your training properly. Go to some exercise counselor who tells you how to do it, but 
don't avoid muscular strength activities just because you're hypertensive and then ok that's epidemiology that we've got to have randomized trials you can't prove anything from observational studies so i have asked dean after nappy and you notice he had a whole stack of papers and one of them is for a new randomized trial that professor brown and i are going to do because there's never been a randomized trial of parachutes so we want you to sign up come and see him after the lecture to you'll get either a parachute or something that looks like a parachute then we're going to take you up 10,000 feet and throw you out and then we will have experimental evidence on whether parachutes work so uh, okay quality of life this is a big randomized trial I forget how 400 and some uh, overweight sedentary unfit postmenopausal women this, and they were all they all exercised in the lab we measured every heartbeat every step so this is kind of at the recommended dose this is about half that one and a half times that and on mental health all groups improved and I love this inner energy I feel more energetic so these women who did only 72 minutes a week of moderate intensity walking at the end of the study that I've, I've got more energy it's good for you uh, being physically active uh, is good, a good treatment for depression. Andrea Dunn did this several years ago. And if depression not diagnosed by questionnaire, but in a psychiatric laboratory, and look, uh, even 80 minutes a week, and those doing 180 minutes a week of walking, and this isn't because they came to an exercise group. She tried to take the social engagement out of this. They came to the lab and walked on a treadmill in a closet. And... 40-45% reduction, uh, remission of depression, which is about the same as medical interventions. Okay, I've got to very quickly go through the life study. These are men and women, 70 to 89 years of age, already on the downward slope of function. The primary outcome, major mobility disability, which according to the geriatricians we work with, inability to walk 400 meters in 15 minutes not a very high standard and we measured this going around these pylons 20 meters apart and here's the primary outcome uh, published uh, just over a year ago in uh, JAMA the physical uh, activity group and the health education group 28 percent difference in risk of persistent mobility disability there'll never be a drug it even comes close to this. So to summarize, just wrap up the next couple of slides. Uh, attributable fraction, epidemiologists like to calculate. Uh, what is the cause of, how, what can we attribute deaths in the population to what cause? So here's several risk factors, all adjusted for age, for health risk, uh, year of exam, and each of the other items in this table low fitness in this calculation 16 to 17 percent of the deaths be attributed to low fitness obesity two or three percent of the deaths and as some of you know Karim Khan like this that he he said oh low fitness is worse for you than is a higher risk than smoke dio obesity because this is more deaths than these three so how are we going to deal with this we need to understand energy balance. We need to test interventions, develop uh, public policy uh, to intervene, to help more people uh, be active, test these interventions. And by the way, we need more support for physical activity research. In the US, $2.4 billion a year on nutrition and obesity. So I go to the website and say, I wonder how much NIH is spending on physical activity. They had 233 categories on the website so how many of those on activity exercise none none I'm not saying they spend no money I mean, I've had millions of dollars uh, from NIH over the years but it's not even important enough for our National Institutes of Health to have a category of activity and fitness I hope you people are doing better than that here well again you all know the WHO physical activity recommendations but here is the miracle drug and I'm going to get extremely wealthy 
collecting the royalty. This is the miracle drug that solves all health problems. Now the pill, it is kind of big, but with a couple of liters, you can get it down, or you could put it on your belt, count your steps, and be sure you're getting 9, 10, 11,000 steps a day, or if you want to try to match the old codger, 5 million a year, see if you can do that. Thank you.